Welcome back. Joining me for a look at the day's market moving news is Chantal Marx from F&B Wealth and Investments. Chantal, thanks so much for joining us today. Now, it's been a bumpy ride for markets this week with the traders digesting the hotter than expected CPI numbers from the US as well as the PPI numbers that came in under expectations. Was the PPI um, number the reason we saw that short-lived sell-off and somewhat of a recovery um, in markets uh, yesterday and earlier on today? Yes, I do think that the market was just grasping at any reason not mm. to continue selling off. Um, I think investors have been really enjoying this kind of Goldilocks outcome to the U.S. Uh, economy and rate cycle. And that CPI print wasn't in keeping with that Goldilocks outcome. Mm. And the PPI numbers, even though it didn't do much in terms of changing expectations for less Fed rate uh, hikes or rate cuts, rather, at least it didn't disappoint to the other side. I think that was more the relief ah, story no, around that. Definitely. Now, a, a central bank that seems to have inflation somewhat under control seems to be the ECB. It kept rates steady, but it has signaled that a rate cut could come as soon as June. What have you made of this move? I mean, most of us did expect the Fed to lead those uh, rate cuts. Yes, yeah, so after that hotter than expected CPI print, actually before that, when the jobs data was really strong the week before, mm. it started to seem as if the ECB is going to cut more and earlier than the Fed. So investors have already kind of adjusted their expectations to that. It's just a bit strange because that's not usually mm. what happens. Usually the Fed starts with one uh, one uh, kind of direction and the, the ECB tends to follow. But the European economy is a lot weaker than the US economy at the moment and inflation has seemed to be a lot less sticky. So there definitely is more, uh, there's more reason for them to cut rates than there is for the Fed. Over in the UK, that economy has posted growth for the second uh, month in a row, up a tepid 0.1%, but it seems like markets have welcomed this move. Now, does this move um, the needle for you when it comes to Britain's economy, the performance of that economy? Oh, shame. They're so happy about the 0.1%. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm not judging because mm. we'd be happy with 0.1% most of the time as well. Um, what this just means is that the, the odds of the technical recession that they're currently in um, kind of having progressed into the first quarter is a lot lower, unless something terrible went wrong in March that the market didn't pick up on. So I think that they do have reason to be quite optimistic around that. And what was really positive for me was that a, a lot of the growth has been driven by the manufacturing sector, mm. um, as well as by, and, and not only by services, although that contributed as well. And I think if they had better weather, um, their, construction, uh, their construction industry, which really dragged on growth, could have also been a positive contributor. So importantly, I think from a UK perspective, it does seem as if that economy has turned a little bit of a corner. And that's why I think you're seeing so much optimism around that uh, pretty low 0.1% growth number. Uh, now let's move over to China. Exports and imports on that front missed expectations, both contracting um, in March. How concerning are these numbers considering we're going to get that uh, GDP print next week? So it's important to remember that uh, Chinese trade data is expressed in U.S. dollars. Uh -huh. um, so a big reason why you are seeing uh, these, the, the, these numbers coming under pressure in U.S. dollar terms is because of a stronger U.S. dollar and a weaker, weaker Chinese uh, local currency. Then you also need to look at volumes. The export volumes were actually very, very high and very uh -huh. strong. It was just a pricing issue as okay. well. So obviously you would want that Goldilocks scenario for China as well, where pricing is high, exports are high, and therefore the trade numbers in US dollars look really strong. Uh, but in this case, pricing is still an issue, but it does seem as if capacity isn't a problem and the actual output of the economy isn't a, a problem. We'll have to see 
see how that translates into the GDP numbers. Obviously, we would want it to, to look a little bit better, but I don't think it's an awful down scenario for them based on these numbers. Uh, thanks so much for clearing that up, actually, Chantal. Now, let's move over to news out uh, back at home. Canal Plus has upped its stake in multi-choice from about 37% to 40%. I mean, it, it's really a back and forth with these two companies. What's the plan here? Um, are we seeing Canal just taking advantage of the current share price um, where that multi-choice is at before that takeover bid is sort of finalized, finalized where um, um, it's pegging the price at 100, I think, and 25 Rand per share? Yes, you're absolutely right. They're taking advantage of the fact that the price hasn't reached 125 rand a mm -hmm. share yet. So they've put out they've put out the mandatory offer to shareholders, which they had to put out because they owned more than 35 percent of the when when they triggered um, a mandatory offer because they owned more than 35 percent of the shares in issue. But the share price hasn't responded to completely close that gap. Mm. So it makes sense for Canal Plus to continue to buy multi-choice shares in the market and wait for uh, before that gap closes. I was actually just surprised to see that the share price was under pressure today after that news. Mm. Uh, because now you have a natural buyer in the market that will bid up the price, or will, will take up stock in the price up until 125. So, yeah, it was a, a bit surprising for me that the share price came under pressure after that announcement. Uh, no, but Chantal, before I let you go, let's get your stock pick. It's a little bit uh, out of kilter for me to go into kind of shorter term um, speculative bets. But mm -hmm. um, I think that there's been some pretty decent action on the on the platinum group metal side of things. But uh, a lot of the stocks have already run and they've only exposed to platinum group metals. And I started thinking about poor old African rainbow minerals that um, the share price has been under so much pressure because of pressure on PGM pricing. But it seems as if the market forgets that they have a big iron ore exposure where pricing has held up well. Mm. And they also have a big stake in Harmony Gold. And Harmony's share price continues to climb quite strongly. I don't think African Rainbow Minerals share price reflects that accurately. And if you strip out Harmony Gold, that stock trades at very low multiples. So I'm thinking that it, um, it could re-rate from here. You know, Arm seems to be a fave today. Our uh, market uh, watcher in the afternoon actually also picked it as his stock pick. Chantal, thanks so <coughs> much for your time and those insights. That was Chantal Marks from FNB Wealth and Investments.